Hey guys and girls, my name is Tim, this is the Solid State Workshop, and today's video is called An Introduction to Linear AC to DC Power Supplies. So if you have no idea what those are, or you want to learn more about what those are, this might be a good video for you. So, sit tight and let's uh, figure this one out. So I guess the first thing we should figure out is what exactly an AC to DC power supply is. And in general, an AC to DC power supply is some kind of device, uh, electronic device that converts AC electricity from, say, your wall outlet into DC electricity that a sensitive piece of electronic equipment or device can use. So uh, we're going to define what AC and DC are later, uh, but that as a definition is what an AC to DC power supply is. So you may ask, well, where would I find one of these AC to DC power supplies? And the answer is a lot of places. For example, your laptop power adapter, that's an example of an AC to DC power supply. Your phone charger is also an AC to DC power supply. And if you have a desktop computer, and if you were to open it up and look in the corner, in the back corner, you'd see this very unsuspecting metal box. Well, that's your AC to DC power supply. So as you can see, they're in a lot of places, and um, they're because they're just um, incredibly vital. Um, without them, we'd not have power for any of the devices that we use. To help illustrate some of the concepts involved in power supply design, I'm going to be using um, some graphics that mimic what you would see if you were to use a piece of test equipment called an oscilloscope. And an oscilloscope is an instrument which allows you to view changes in voltage over time. And that's what one looks like in um, actuality. We're not going to be using a real oscilloscope today, but we'll be using some graphics that look like the screen on an oscilloscope. So this box to the right here represents the screen on an oscilloscope. Um, now, on the x-axis we have time, and on the y-axis we have voltage, and voltage can be either positive or negative, de uh, depending on whether or not it's above or below this zero volt line right here. And um, we also have this grid, this uh, grid of lines that covers the oscilloscope. And this grid is called the graticule. And each line uh, represents an increment in both the units, so both voltage and time. Uh, it's uh, one increment. So um, for instance, between here and here, might be one millisecond and between here and here might be one volt so um, with all this put together we can figure out and we can observe how voltage changes with respect to time which is extraordinarily useful in electronics design and troubleshooting um, so if that didn't make sense to you right now, I would really recommend you pause and try to figure it out because it's going to be really helpful um, because you're going to visually be able to see what's going on in these circuits, uh, especially the power supply circuits that we're going to get into in this video. So in all electrical and electronic systems, there's two different types of current. And the first one we're going to look at is direct current or DC. And in DC, the direction of current is always the same because the voltage is always um, greater than zero for the over over time. So if we look at the oscilloscope, there is what we would see. Um, the voltage here that we look at uh, at this point is over this entire stretch greater than the zero line here. So. Um, just, of course, to reiterate the point, at uh, delta T equals 0 seconds, the voltage we measure 1.5 volts. At delta T equals 3 seconds, 1.5 volts. And at delta T equals 7 seconds, 1.5 volts. So, uh, exactly what I just said, but I had these little animations for you. The voltage is consistently 
greater than zero. Now, direct current can also work in the other direction as long as it's, um, it can also work as consistently a negative voltage. So if it was below the zero volt line for the entire time, so if it was down here somewhere for the entire time, that is still direct current, it's just flowing in the opposite direction. Alternating current is a little bit different. Um, well, it's actually quite a bit different. In alternating current, the direction of current is constantly changing because the voltage is constantly passing through zero volts. So it's changing from a positive voltage to a negative voltage, and then from a negative voltage to a positive voltage. And this causes the current to kind of oscillate back and forth. So if we look at the oscilloscope, that is an AC waveform, as you can see. Part of the AC waveform is above the above that zero volt line, but then another part is below that zero volt line. So from here to here, our current goes in one direction, and then when it gets to this point right here, it stops very very briefly, and then reverses direction and goes another and goes in the reverse, and then it does it over again and does it over until the cows come home. So. Uh, that that's alternating current. And alternating current is good for some things, but for a lot of our electronics and for our more sensitive equipment, it's really no good for powering it. So, um, as I had in the other in the other slide, um, here we are. Um, at this point here, we're at two volts, and then we're gonna we're gonna hit zero volts, and then over time we're gonna hit a negative voltage. Um, so just to really drive that home. So now we're going to try to get into some of the design aspects and the, the steps you need to take in order to convert our AC from a wall outlet to that nice straight line DC uh, that we saw two slides ago. So the voltage that is available and is provided at a wall outlet is really much too high. And it's always changing polarity, or always changing, um, and the current is always changing direction because it's AC. And because of that, it makes it useless for sensitive electronics. So the first thing that we need to do is to reduce that voltage. And we're going to do that using a transformer. And here's our trans. Oh, how did that get in there? Oh, I'm such a jokester, I know. All right. Um, but a transformer is a device that allows us to convert an AC voltage, note AC voltage, to a higher or lower level. So, um, as I kind of emphasized before, a transformer can only be used with alternating current. So if you were to uh, provide a direct current to a transformer, um, it wouldn't work at all as you'd want it to. So, um, they operate on the basis of a theory, or I guess it's, I don't know if it's even a theory anymore, it's basically proven, but an electromagnetic theory called mutual inductance, which basically means um, when you have two coils wrapped around a, a common iron or ferrous core, um, the energy is transferred from one coil to another coil. That's basically what, what that means and you'll see what that means on the next slide. So around five or six seconds ago, I was talking about transformers and how they're devices that have um, a common iron core and two coils wrapped around them. So um, let's see what that would look like. Right here, we have a, a iron core, and what we would do is we would wrap around some wire on one side and then we could wrap around some wire on the other side and although they're not physically touching and they're electrically isolated meaning that there's no electrical contact between these two sides here the um the theory of mutual inductance says that the that the energy will be transferred um over to that other coil um, if you have a voltage applied on this side here and um, and that's what would happen so let's say that on this blue side here which we're gonna call the primary side also known as the input side uh, 
um, we have twice as many turns or twice as many loops around this core as we have on this green side which is also known as the secondary side or our output side so we have twice as many loops on this side around the core as we have on this side um, and now if we were to apply a hundred and uh, on, oh well here here's the ratio two to one and if we were to apply a hundred and twenty volts to our primary input side then what would you guess would be the output voltage if we have a ratio of two to one and you guessed it 60 volts and so on that on that secondary side we'd have half the voltage because we have half as many uh, loops of wire on that secondary side so that's really awesome and it's um, extraordinarily useful uh, just like every component in a power supply uh, but it's it's uh, really really important that we can be able to do this if we were to use the transformer we just described in the previous slide we'd get something that looks a little bit like this what you see here is on the blue trace you see the 120 volts input and on the yellow trace you see the 60 volts output and this type of transformer is known as a step down transformer and step down um, I guess is an obvious name for it because it reduces the voltage another thing we should we should note here is that the frequency is not changed by the transformer that's why all of these peaks and all these troughs and every time it passes through zero they all line up with each each other both on the input and the output the amplitude or the voltage is less um, but the frequency remains the same so depending on where you live that's between 50 and 60 Hertz so that is probably I guess the two things uh, that you should know about transformer transformers come in all shapes and sizes the first one we're gonna look at is the e core transformer if you could take a guess as to why it's called an e core transformer you guessed it yeah it's because it's core is shaped like an E Wow mind-blowing uh, but anyway you can't see the middle part of the E here uh, because it is wrapped in wire but if you were to take it apart you you definitely see it and the e-core transformer is relatively inexpensive and it has a pretty good performance so it's pretty widely used because of that the next type of transformer is the toroidal transformer here in the middle a toroidal transformer looks a little bit like a donut, though I wouldn't bite into it because, well, your dentist, well, your dentist would be happy about it after you pay the bill, but uh, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't bite into it. But anyway, uh, the toroidal transformer has a couple advantages over a standard E-core transformer. Uh, a, a toroidal transformer works in the same way an E-core transformer it does, but it does it debatably a little better, and the reason is because it produces less stray magnetic fields which is good for more sensitive equipment like audio or maybe medical equipment and in addition it's a little more efficient it can be a little smaller um, produce uh, it's a little better regulated than the e-core transformer but this is all at the literal expense of price and toroidal transformers require a little more complex machinery to manufacture and that's why they, they tend to be more expensive but if you need them they are available the final type of transformer which is actually quite similar to an e-core transformer in construction uh, but its use is a little different and that is the high frequency transformer and the high frequency transformer isn't typically used in a linear power supply which is what we're talking about today usually these are used in switch mode power supplies which we'll briefly 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 talk about at the end of this video but uh, high frequency transformers are generally a little smaller and they can operate at higher frequencies hence the name though we have successfully reduced the voltage we still have the problem of the voltage fluctuating from a positive value to a negative value and then back to a positive value and so forth and this of course causes the current to kind of oscillate and and go back and forth inside the conductors so to force 
the current to only flow in one direction and to stop reversing we just want to go in one direction we're going to construct a circuit called a bridge rectifier and it uses four semiconductor devices called diodes here's the circuit for a bridge rectifier and a bridge rectifier uses four diodes and a diode remember only allows current to flow in one direction and if you look at the, the circuit symbol up here it only allows current to go from anode to cathode or in the direction of the arrow that's the only way that current is allowed to flow through a diode and in this circuit over here we have it arranged in a way that it'll force the current to only flow in one direction so let's try to figure out how this works so say we have a current that flows in through here in this direction and it's going to go out in this direction so this is when the voltage is positive the voltage of the AC is above that zero volt line on our oscilloscope in this case what's going to happen is the current is going to go through this diode here it can't go through this diode right here because it's reverse biased so it's going to go through it's going to go through this diode into our load our resistor we're going to call the load back out from the load and it's going to meet up right here and it it can't go through this diode because this diode is going to be reverse biased again and instead it's going to go through this diode and then back back out to the the source all right so so remember the the current was flowing through the load in this direction clockwise I guess you would say now if we if we have a negative voltage our current flows in the opposite direction so let's see what would happen our current comes in here and it's flowing in this direction and it comes up to here and it can't go here because that's reverse biased so it goes through this diode here and then it can't go here so it goes through the load and it comes back comes back comes back comes back and once again now it's going to go through this diode here and out so what did we just observe well we observed that even though the alternating current was going in the opposite direction it went through the load in the same direction as it did when the voltage was positive so that's really that's really awesome so let's see what that uh, that'll look like on the oscilloscope so here's what it would look like on an oscilloscope and there we are the yellow trace is our output from our bridge rectifier and our blue trace is the input to the bridge rectifier coming from the transformer so a bridge rectifier in a mathematical sense I guess uh, takes the absolute value of that AC waveform that you provide it with so wherever it went negative the the AC you now produced a, a mirrored positive voltage and now instead of the current constantly reversing and going back and forth and back and forth the current now goes in one direction only so now we're in uh, we're one step one step in the right direction and if you look on the oscilloscope here you'll notice something a little bit funny and that's that the the output of the bridge rectifier has an amplitude slightly less than that of the input to the bridge rectifier which doesn't seem to make too much sense but if you think about how a diode works a diode you need about 0.7 volts in order to turn on a diode so you need to provide that diode with some push to get it to work and with that push you lose some of your voltage so if you lose 0.7 volts across a diode that's what you're seeing there and you're probably gonna see two diode losses two diode drops across um, two diode drops is what you're viewing there because you have a bridge rectifier so usually it's not too big of a deal if you lose uh, a volt or two on a bridge um, rectifier but if you're working with some really low AC voltages it might it might actually make a difference so always keep that in mind that you are gonna lose a little bit of voltage when you use um, any type of rectifier Here are some examples 
of bridge rectifiers. Now, bridge rectifiers can be made of four discrete diodes, as we saw in the in the slide uh, two slides ago, and we can arrange them. And this is fairly cost effective because these diodes individually are pennies or less, probably even less. So they can be very it can be very cheap to construct a bridge rectifier using these individual diodes. The problem they have the problem that you have with using individual diodes is that usually they can't handle too much current. You might be able to pass about one amp here through uh, these discrete diodes. So if that's enough for you, then 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 uh, then that should work. But for higher current applications, you generally have to go with these integrated packaged diode bridges or bridge rectifiers. And this is, I guess, what you would call a GBU type bridge. At least that's what I know it as. Most of the, the the names of these parts are GBU and then some number. And um, these can usually sync, I don't know, between 3 and 5 amps or something. They can pass 3 and 5 amps or maybe even more, 7 amps, depending on how big of a package you get. So if you have a little higher current need, then you'd get something that looks like these, like this. And this, these are pretty common, actually. You'll see these in a lot of different power supplies. And if you even have even higher current passing ability, you would get one of these high-powered bridges here, which are chassis, chassis mount, and they get bolted right down to the metal on a chassis or, or to a heat sink of some sort and you attach quick connect uh, terminals to them because well they pass so much current that they need these low low resistance connections so these are especially useful if you need to pass you know upwards of maybe 20 amps or 30 amps or something like that a very high powered application but i guess for the most part most people are going to be encountering a, either discrete diodes or a smaller diode bridge like this and there's many other types as well come in different types of packages but these are I guess some of the most common so woohoo we have direct current or well at least by definition it's direct current uh, our current all flows in the same direction now but we have these mountains on our oscilloscope and that's not too great this this fluctuation in voltage can have ill effects on whatever circuit we're trying to power and the reason is because a lot of semiconductor devices like the diode we just talked about but other things too like a processor might have minimum turn on voltages or or a voltage that they need to uh, work properly so for like a diode you need 0.7 volts across it and for maybe like a processor you might need 5 volts or something and we have all this fluctuation in voltage, and a lot of times the voltage falls beneath these these different requirements. So it might fall beneath 5 volts for a certain amount of time. And that's not good because for the time that it's below 5 volts, that processor is going to be off. So it won't work, and then you know your circuit is pointless. So because it dips is constantly dipping to very low voltages we have a lot of problems so to fix this problem we're going to use something called a filter capacitor or filter capacitors and we're going to see how that works on the next slide here's the circuit now including the filter capacitor on the output of the bridge rectifier and the filter capacitor is really going to help to remove that ripple. It's going to smooth out that ripple that we saw on the oscilloscope in the previous slides. And how is it going to do that? Well, if you remember how a capacitor works, if you pass a current through a capacitor, you charge it up, kind of like a battery, but a little bit differently. You can charge it much more quickly. So if you, um, if you pass a current through a capacitor, you charge it up and you store charge in its electric field, uh, because there's two plates here and because the plates aren't touching you can create a voltage you can you can create a voltage a difference in potential between these two plates here so essentially you have a little voltage source when you charge it up kind of like a battery again but not quite 
So if you imagine the waveform when it's rising, the waveform that we have, it's rising, it charges up that capacitor to some voltage. And then as that waveform, as the waveform from the bridge rectifier, the waveform here and here, as that waveform drops in voltage, the capacitor still has a certain voltage across it. And, and the capacitor effectively is kind of like a little buffer. As the waveform from the bridge rectifier drops very quickly, the capacitor doesn't discharge nearly as quickly. And so the effective voltage across the load here is much more constant. And we'll see what I mean by that in the next slide. Here's the effect of a filter capacitor on the circuit. This is if we use a relatively low capacitance. So what happens here? Well, the blue waveform is from the bridge rectifier, and the yellow waveform, or the yellow trace, is the output of the filter capacitor across the load. So as the, as the bridge rectifier pr produces a voltage that ramps up here, we charge up our capacitor. And as the blue waveform from the bridge rectifier dips all the way down to zero, you notice that the voltage across the capacitor does not go all the way down to zero. Instead, it might go down to a, a much uh, a higher voltage. Say this might be, I don't know, one volt or a half a volt here. And so as the capacitor discharges, as the charge rushes out of that capacitor and through the load, its voltage also decreases a little bit. And that's what you see here, this relatively straight ramp downwards. And the reason that happens is because as the charge exits the capacitor, uh, less charge in a capacitor means there's less voltage across that capacitor. And now, say we used a, a higher capacitance. Well, if we use a higher capacitance, the capacitor can, can provide a greater voltage for a longer amount of time. And that's useful for us because now you see the voltage doesn't dip down nearly as much. And we'll see how that would be helpful in a second. And if there was such thing as an infinite capacitor, if one existed, we would get a perfectly straight line like that. And that would be all fine and dandy, except infinite capacitors don't exist. So it's pretty hard to use something that doesn't exist. Right. Here's some examples of filter capacitors. They're all actually very similar, but there are some distinctions to be made. The first type over here on the left in the yellow box is the standard electrolytic capacitor. An electrolytic capacitor is used very widely for a filter capacitor because it has a very high capacitance density, meaning you can get a very large capacitance out of a relatively small package, which is why it's very useful. It's not the most high performance capacitor of all time. It doesn't respond well to transients very well, but for the most part it's is sufficient. Now how is an electrolytic capacitor made? Well you get two long, maybe three or four foot strips of aluminum. You put a paper soaked in a liquid dielectric in between these two strips and you roll it up. And you roll it up real tight and then you stuff it in a can like this and you put two leads coming out of it. Basically that's what an electrolytic capacitor is. So those two metal aluminum strips are acting as two parallel plates and that's what creates the capacitor and you have a liquid dielectric to separate them now to the right in the green box we have bulk electrolytic capacitors now these are the exact same technology as the standard electrolytic capacitors I'm just making the distinction because they're different and people might call them a different name like a bulk capacitor a bulk capacitor is just a bigger version of this electrolytic capacitor over here and a bulk capacitor just of course as I said has a higher capacitance and they might be just a little beefier meant for a little beefier applications the way they're attached to the circuit boards also a little different well not really but a little bit they use these snap-in terminals here versus just standard through hole legs really not too much of a difference between those two but yeah thought I'd point it out and the last type over here which isn't used nearly as much but they do have some use is the solid polymer type capacitors and solid polymer are actually constructed very similar to 
standard electrolytic capacitors, except instead of having a liquid dielectric separating the rolled up aluminum strips, we have a solid polymer acting as a dielectric. And what does this do? Well, it improves reliability because the liquid dielectric in electrolytic capacitors uh, many times will dry up, and that actually causes a lot of failure in uh, all bunch all sorts of electronics. That when that dielectric dries up, the capacitor doesn't work as it once used to. So the solid polymer doesn't really dry up because, well, it's already dry, and it's meant to be dry, so it'll last longer. Usually they have better performance than standard electrolytic capacitors, but this is, of course, all at the expense of being more pricey. But sometimes you do need them, and they are available if you need them. The power supply that we have right now consists of a transformer, a bridge rectifier, and a filter capacitor. This type of power supply is called an unregulated power supply. The reason it's called an unregulated power supply is because its voltage, the voltage it produces, is highly dependent on other factors. So the voltage it produces depends on the demand of the load and the capacitance that we provide. If the load is very demanding and our capacitance is not very, not very much, then we're going to see a lot of ripple on the output of our power supply because it's going to be discharging that capacitor very quickly and causing the voltage to drop. Also, something that we didn't touch on before is that the output voltage is highly dependent on the input voltage across the transformer. Remember, the transformer works in a ratio. It, uh, it works by transforming the voltage in a ratio. So if, if our voltage, say, from the wall outlet is a 140 volts instead of 120 volts, well, what happens? Well, the output voltage from that transformer will also increase because the output is not set at a certain value. It's simply just scaled down. So that can be a problem because now if the output of voltage from our transformer is too high for our circuit or um, if it's too high, there's no way of controlling it here. You simply get that maximum voltage. Ideally, we want the output voltage of the power supply to remain constant regardless of changes in the load and regardless of fluctuations from the voltage source. So we want the output voltage to be completely independent of all other factors. So to accomplish this, we're going to use this wonderful integrated circuit called a voltage regulator. And it does exactly what its name implies. It keeps the voltage regulated at a set value. Here's the voltage regulator placed in circuit. As you can see, it's a three terminal device. You have an input pin here an output pin here, and a pin that goes to ground. Now, on the input, you of course apply your input voltage. On the output, you get a regulated constant voltage, and ground goes to ground. So, you can buy voltage regulators in fixed values. So you can buy a 5-volt regulator, or a 9-volt regulator, or a 12-volt regulator. Or you can buy an adjustable type regulator, where you can adjust the output voltage using some external components. So a couple design tips for you. In order for the voltage regulator to work, you need to apply an input voltage that is, in general, at least 2 volts greater than what you expect on your output. So if you have a 5 volt regulator, you need to provide at the very least 7 volts at this pin. And if you don't provide 7 volts, well you're not going to get 5 volts on the output. So, take that one more step, and what does this mean for our capacitor? Well, we want to choose a capacitor that will produce a voltage across it that never will dip below 7 volts. Because if it dips below 7 volts, then at any point where it's below 7 volts, then our output will be less than 5 volts. And the voltage, this difference in voltage, this 2 volts that we're talking about that the voltage regulator needs, that difference between here and here, that voltage is called the dropout voltage of the voltage regulator. Now they make low dropout voltage regulators, or LDOs as they're called, and these might have dropout voltages of maybe a volt or a half a volt. So you could have 
a voltage across your capacitor that's much more close to the voltage you expect on the output of your regulator across your load. But those are a little more expensive, but they're pretty widely used. If you're like I am, you might be curious as to how exactly this voltage regulator works. Because we know what it does, but we don't really understand how or why it's able to do what it does. So, I'm going to try to explain what's going on internally in a voltage regulator. And so here is a simplified block diagram schematic that kind of highlights what's going on inside a voltage regulator. Now in reality, the real schematic is much more complicated because everything is in terms of discrete transistors and discrete components, pa passive components. But for now, this should do. So we're going to look at each component individually. And the first one is this red triangle in the middle here. And this red triangle is an operational amplifier, or an op amp for short. And an op amp has two inputs. It has this negative sign or minus sign labeled input, and that's called an inverting input. And it has this plus sign labeled input, and that's called a non-inverting input. And it also has one output over here. And the op amp has one goal in life, and that is to make its two inputs be the same voltage, to have the same voltage on both of these pins here. And you may ask, well, how can you possibly change an input? You know, it's an input. The nature of an input is that it goes in. How do you change what goes in? Well, you change what goes in by connecting a feedback loop to one of those inputs. And this feedback loop right here will be able to change the voltage on that inverting input right here. All right, so now let's look at the next part here. And the next part we're going to look at is the voltage reference. And the voltage reference, or VREF that's labeled here, is in this pink pentagon. And this voltage reference is connected to the non-inverting input, or the plus input here. So what is the job of a voltage reference? Well, the job of voltage reference reference is to provide a stable, unconditional voltage to that non-inverting input. So regardless of all conditions, temperature, how much current is being passed, uh, anything, basically, the voltage reference will produce a voltage on this pin that does not change. So we'll see how that works or how that's helpful in a minute or two. And the third part of the circuit that we're going to look at is this part over here on the right consisting of two resistors. And this these two resistors form what is called a voltage divider. And we know that if we connect two resistors across a voltage from ground, I mean from, from a voltage to ground, and then you look at the voltage on the node in between these resistors, you see a voltage here that is proportional to the voltage up here. So in the instance that both resistors are the same values, and you know their values are not important, but they're the same values, then the voltage at the middle here will be half. All right. So the last major element that we're going to look at is this yellow piece over here, and this is our pass element, and in this case it's an NPN bipolar transistor. And this is working as what is called a voltage controlled current source. And this means when you alter the amount of current that flows into this base here, into the base of this NPN transistor, you alter how much collector emitter current flows. So by having a small amount of base current flow into this, into this transistor, you have a small collector to emitter current. And if you put a large current, a really large current into this base, then you get a large collector emitter current. And again, hopefully we'll see how this works later. So let's try to tie all this together. Let's imagine a situation where, say we wanted 5 volts on this output over here. Well, how are we going to get 5 volts on that output regardless of all other conditions? Let's start off by looking at the resistor network here. Let's say we make the value of both resistors to be the same as we talked about before. What is that going to do? Well, we know if, if this is going to be 5 volts up here, 
And if these two resistor values are the same, then it'll have 2.5 volts here. And let's just say that we also set our voltage reference to be 2.5 volts here. So if, if this is at 2.5 volts, and this is at 2.5 volts, then the op amp is going to be happy because both inputs are the same. And when both inputs are the same, in this case, 2.5 volts and 2.5 volts, then we must have 5 volts up here because the voltage divider is dividing it by 2 in this case. So 2.5 times 2 is 5 up here. So that's kind of in its happy state. But now let's just say, for instance, that the load, which we're going to say is a resistor connected on the output here to ground, suddenly decreases in resistance, or effectively it gets more demanding. Ohm's law is going to tell us that the voltage across the load will also drop. So the voltage up here, appearing at the top of this resistor right here, will also drop, meaning um, that the voltage here between the two resistors on the voltage divider also drop. So this will cause our feedback network to produce a lower voltage and in a matter of microseconds the op amp is going to change its output to match to get the the inverting input here to match this non-inverting I mean uh, yes this non-inverting input so let's just say that this voltage here dropped to two point three volts then the output of this op amp is going to force more current into the base of this transistor to allow for a greater collector emitter current and when there's a greater collector emitter current then there will be a, a greater voltage across the load and a greater voltage will appear at the top of this resistor and thus will stabilize again at 5 volts up here and it will get 2.5 volts up here. And again if it worked in the opposite direction where the load got less demanding or the resistance went up then the output, uh, the op amp will output a, a lower current and the lower current Will drive a uh, will mean that there's a smaller collector emitter current, and a smaller collector emitter current will fix the voltage up here appropriately. So it works in all different situations. It could be there could be a fluctuation in the input voltage over here, and the op amp again will will re react accordingly to stabilize that there will always be five volts up here, and it'll do that by using its sensing feedback network here. So hopefully that made some bit of sense. I know I'm not the best explainer, but hopefully so this gives you a good idea as to how this we works. We needed a five volt regulated right, supply as on. we talked about in the previous slide. And let's say we supply it with a voltage that looked like this. And the blue voltage is from the filter capacitor. And the yellow voltage is the output of the voltage regulator. So as you can see the input that we gave to the voltage regulator isn't anything special really it's it's kind of ugly looking but the voltage regulator is able to take care of all those fluctuations um, provided uh, that the input voltage to the regulator or the output voltage from the filter capacitor uh, same thing is at least and always two volts greater than than the output we're expecting which is five volts so as you can see on the input or rather the output of the capacitor here this voltage is changing but as long as there's these bottoms here these little troughs in the in the voltage as long as those never pass below 7 volts which is 2 greater than 5 then everything will work just fine and you know voltage regulators have finite response times to to um adjusting the output voltage but for this case the the frequency here is was it 120 hertz or something so it's not anything that the voltage regulator can't take care of uh, rather easily so don't be worried about that here are some examples of the packages that voltage regulators can come in and a package is simply the shape or the form that a particular component takes so the most common is the TO220 package and you'll see these a lot if you open up some electronics. 
or even if you're gonna if you're gonna design your own, you'll probably use one of these. TO220 um, can pass usually between one and two amperes. Um, that's its thermal limitation. It can't do much more than that, but that's usually enough for most applications that you'll encounter. Uh, a step up from that is a TO3 package. These aren't used as much anymore, but these are a more traditional package that you might have seen in years past, but they are still used, not probably as widely, but still used. And these can pass much higher currents, usually in excess of 5 amps or something like that. They can do that. Um, again, they all work all the same. They all are three terminal devices, uh, but they're used in different applications. And over here we have a TO... 92 package and TO92 is the same package that's used on small signal transistors and you'd use a regulator in a TO92 package if you didn't really have to supply too much current and maybe you didn't have enough space on your board to fit a, a big TO220 or something like that so a TO92 can usually at its very maximum pass about 500 milliamps or about a half of a half of an amp which isn't too much, and I wouldn't even get close to that maximum because these packages are really not designed to to um, dissipate too much too much heat. But for a lot of applications, 500 milliamps or even less than that is is uh, more than enough to power your circuit. On this slide, we have some part names of some commonly used voltage regulators, and so if you're ever going to go purchase some or you see them in a circuit, you might recognize them. The most popular line of voltage regulators is the LM78 series. And LM78, as you see, I've written here XX. And where the XX is, is where you would uh, insert a certain voltage. So if it was a 5 volt regulator, it'd be an LM7805. And if it was a 9 volt regulator, it would be a 7809. And if it was a 12 volt regulator, you got it, LM7812. All right, so that's how you would identify those regulators. The LM317 is also very popular, and the LM317 is an adjustable regulator, meaning you can choose what your output voltage is using a feed, uh, feedback resistor network. The LM338 is a higher powered version of the 317, basically. It's, I think, I believe it's a, either a three or a five amp version of the 317. The LM723 is an older chip that actually has a couple more options um, and you can work with a little more, but it's kind of a, it can be a kind of a pain and not worth it, but it depends on what you're doing. The L200 is also an adjustable regulator, but it also has two extra pins to provide current, um, current control. So you can set a maximum current that you'd like it to pass and that can be good for uh, applications where you need that and the LT 1085 is a linear technologies part and it is some might say it's an improvement on the LM 317 but the 317 is still very widely used today thanks for sticking with me for this entire video we're gonna recap basically everything we've talked about in this entire presentation so what did we learn well we're gonna look at the basic linear power supply topology right here so first, we have our mains input from our wall outlet. It produces either 120 volts or 240 volts AC. We need to reduce this voltage because it's, it's really much, much too high. So we use a transformer, which makes the voltage lower, but it's still alternating current. So to make it into direct current, we use a bridge rectifier. And the bridge rectifier forces all the current to flow in the same direction but it's still kind of erratic as you can see. So to get rid of some of those, that ripple on the bridge rectifier, we use filter capacitors. That helps to smooth it out. And once it's smoothed out enough for us, we're gonna use a voltage regulator and the voltage regulator ensures that the output voltage of our power supply is constant regardless of the input conditions or the load. And that's basically the topology of a basic linear power supply. There can be more complicated versions with different and more things in them, but for our sake, this is basically how we would do it. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope you got something useful from it because I know it's always tough to get on the right foot for any topic and especially in electronics. You know, you want to learn something. It's, it's not always easy to
get started with it. So hopefully I gave you a decent or good enough introduction for you to go further um, with your exploration in power supplies and linear power supplies and switch mode power supplies and any type of power supply. So um, I'd love to hear your feedback if you have anything at all to say, anything that you need or want answered. I can do my best. Um, I am in college, so sometimes I might not get back to you too quickly, but um, I'll do my best. So if you like the video, please thumbs it up. And if you want to see more content, you can subscribe to my channel and I will do my best. Thanks so much.